very good. Yeah, so uh, hello everyone uh, and good morning. I believe it is uh, morning for the most. Uh, might be very early morning for some if you are joining from the from the US, but welcome anyway. So this is Eddie uh, 2020 uh, and uh, especially a session number six reuse and uh, quality. So we are about to begin uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, some, most of you know these uh, from yesterday already. So please note the session is being recorded. Um, you have seen a note regarding this when you joined. So, um, and as you probably as, uh, know, uh, all your microphones are muted at the moment. Um, so should you uh, want to speak, please raise your hand uh, about the default method. Uh, to ask questions uh, uh, is to uh, use the Q&A functionality in the Zoom. You'll find it in in the bottom of your screen uh, where the raise hand and chat button buttons are as well. So the presenters may answer your questions live or in the, uh, I believe also in the Q&A tool uh, in writing as well after the presentation if, they, if we don't have time to answer all questions uh, during, the, during the session or during the question time. So to comply with the GDPR, uh, you, you are not able to see uh, all the participants in the session. So please use the chat to say hi, to find out who are here. Or we have the Discord, uh, if you're a Discord user, uh, there is a channel as well. But I assure you, we have an audience at the moment. I think we have uh, 40, uh, 55 attendees, everyone uh, included. And one more way to connect contact with uh, people is to use Twitter with the handle Eddie 2020. So I think that's the housekeeping rules. So let's start. My name is Thomas Salatera. Uh, I come from uh, FST, uh, which is not located in Paris. Uh, you might have guessed, despite my beautiful, beautiful view um, to the Eiffel Tower, uh, but in, uh, in, in Finland. Today we have four presentations, uh, each about 20 minutes, and we hope to take a few questions after each session. Uh, but as said, yeah, the q and is your way uh, to the panelists. So first up, we have a presentation by uh, Elodie Petran and Adash Milevsky uh, on collaborative work in the French research infrastructure. And uh, I'll briefly present our speakers. LD has a master's degree in social analytic methods, analysis methods from the Social Sciences University in Poitiers. She joins uh, the National Institute of Democratic Studies in 2013 to work with the ELA project uh, and then joined Sciences Po in 2016 to coordinate the panel management team and activities. And uh, at the moment, she's senior as engineer at Projedo, documenting and disseminating, disseminating data at the National Archive of Data from official statistics in the, for the scientific community. Another is a social science study engineer working at the University Data Platform of Lille in France, which also a university where she got her master's degree in social science study engineering in 2014. Her work involves keeping students and researchers up to date with the latest standards and requirements in data production, collection and analysis, and we will hear more about this in the next presentation. So the virtual floor is yours. Uh, hi everybody. Um, I share the screen with the PowerPoint. Can you see it? Yes, looks good. Okay. So our idea today with uh, this kind of daring title is that documenting is not enough by showing an example of collaborative work in a French research infrastructure that is Projedo. In first, I will present what is Projedo and what is ADISP, the service where I'm working. And then Ada will talk about our activities within the university data platform. Then we'll speak about the collaborative work in the data cycle. So what is Projedo? It's a large, research, large French, French research infrastructure and as a central player in national data policy in the field of the human and social sciences, Projedo supports the development of facilities for archiving, documenting data and making it available, including a system for secured remote access to confidential data, the CIDO. 
It also supports the participation to the production of large multidisciplinary studies of national interest and selected by the European Infrastructure Roadmap. And it also uh, supports the animation of national dynamics centered on the field of competence of the infrastructure. So at uh, uh, an international level, uh, Projeto supports the French part of European survey, such as uh, DGP or uh, the European uh, Social Survey. It also gives access to the French researchers in social currencies who are not only working on national problematics to international uh, database by financing the access. And uh, Projeto is a member of CESA and uh, backed by CNRS, the French representative of the consortium. At a national level, Projeto organized the dissemination of data. And as a uh, ADISP engineer, I will focus on the ADISP um, uh, service within Projeto. But uh, there is also two other uh, data provider centers, uh, which are uh, INED and uh, the CDFP. Uh, Projeto also manages the network of university data platform. And uh, Ada will talk about it just after me. So ADIP, ADISP is the National Archive of Data from Official Statistics. Uh, it's a service of the large research infrastructure project, as I was saying. It collects and archives data furnished by our producers, who are INSEE and uh, the Ministry of Statistics Services. It also documents data from those official statistics, such as census data, uh, localized data, etc., by the use of post professional standards for documentation and data sets, the DDI standard. It also disseminates uh, data to the scientific community and we also assist and advise users. So within the ADISP, we have around uh, 1400 references and uh, about 80 to 100 new re references per year. And we are updating uh, around 30 to 50 uh, references a year too. We are adding the metadata using Nesta Publisher and uh, creating an XML file in uh, DDI using DDI 1.2. And our main activity is documenting the data produced by the official statistics. We aim to disseminate the detailed description of data, but we are also uh, publishing a general description of data with the abstract the, with who is the producer, the universe. We can put link to documents, uh, mainly uh, questionnaire and uh, dictionary code. Uh, in the detailed description of data, I'm sure everyone knows about it. We can add question and investigator's instruction, and uh, we are adding label of variables and localities. So the XML file generated by Nesta allows us to publish the data and uh, metadata. Uh, we can, it's uh, automati automatically feeding the ADISP website and the ADISP uh, Nesta um, platform. It's also harvested in the social science browser Isidore. And we are manually feeding the question bank, uh, Twitter account of uh, ADISP, and the Ketle Projeto Diffusio command application using, using sorry, the XML notebooks. And now I will let Ada uh, talk about the university data platform. With the microphone on is better. Uh, thank you, Elodie. Thank you, everyone, for being here and listening to us. Um, so I'll be talking about university data platforms. There's a network of 13 of them at now, at the moment. Uh, they were only seven three years ago because the government uh, is trying to encourage uh, a policy of data production and dissemination and to build a culture of data nationwide. So they have been supporting creation of new PUDs or UDPs uh, within, uh, within the country. As I was saying, the mission of UDPs is to develop a data culture by working closely with all research actors so I am situated within the uh, Lille data platform, which you can see way up north, closer to Thomas. <laughs> uh, so I don't have the controls to, um, to the slides. Yeah, thank you, Elodie. 
So what is the working environment of UDPs and our, uh, our, our beneficiaries? We are supported by public teaching and research institutions. Here in Lille, my um, employment is thanks to University of Lille. And we are housed by Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, which are a national network of regional institutes of human sciences. So housed means we're actually situated within them. And uh, we are scientifically, scientifically coordinated by the large research infrastructure Projet d'eau, which means it's an acronym for Production et Gestion de Données. So data management production, but there's also dissemination in it. We provide these services to uh, each, each, PU, each UDP provides services to the regional public made of uh, users involved in research, uh, such as researchers or professors or students and research engineers like ourselves that are working with quantitative data in human and social sciences. Uh, we will be talking about the uh, roles of the ADIS and UDPs within the data cycle. A very important stage, uh, including involving DDI, is the planning research stage. So within the research planning stage, the UDPs, it's not working for it now. <laughs> the university data platforms inform users on the most recent regulations and practices regarding data production, such as uh, the GDPR, data management plans, and FAIR principles. And they assist the users in creating their data management plans and direct them to the data protection officers and other necessary correspondence within their unit, their research unit. So with this, sorry. Go so ahead. with this uh, work uh, from the university data platform, data that reaches ADISP once produced will be more easily documented and ADISP can also assist users in finding the right data to use in their project. And within the collecting and processing data and analyzing it, and so within, within these two stages, the university data platforms can help users uh, by organizing workshops on methods and how to use um, software, data analysis software, uh, at times, we can advise users on which methods and software to use in their research. Uh, we focus mainly on freeware, uh, as it is easier for users, once they learn how to use uh, software here, to apply it at home without extra cost. And we can assist users and researchers in using the Nestar platform uh, through collective workshops or individually uh, when we have time. And at ADISP, uh, we are um, three engineers and we are, we are um, teaching the uh, uni university data platform engineer on, engineers on how to use the Nestar platform. So in the matter of publishing and sharing data, uh, ADISP receives the data in the documentation, we verifies their consistency and uses them to create the metadata. So data and metadata are disseminated using the Ketley Projet d'eau diffusion application, as I was saying in my presentation earlier. And ADIS manages access to the data using this web portal. We also supplies access to the metadata variables and primary statistics via a Nestar WebView server. And university data platforms will inform users on where and how they can access the data they are looking for meaning researchers will come to us and students asking where they can find data on a certain subject. And we're building experience day by day in learning where data can be found on very various subjects. So it's a very, uh, specific, it is a competence very specific to UDPs, which other research engineers will not have because they will only know about data in their own field. So this is something that only UDPs can bring about. In the matter of preserving data, ADISP uses ZDI standard for archiving and preserving the data and metadata via Nesta. And UDPs will inform users on the latest requirements and data preservation and access. Uh, 
uh, in the matter of re reusing data, the DDS standard that ADIS uses allows for multiple reuse of stored data over time since, since it's, it's a standard and all the service supplies for uh, the analyzing stage by both parties are also necessary for reusing the data. If you want to ask, to add something, I don't know. No, it's okay. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, to conclude, uh, it's, uh, for us, it's a virtual circle of mutual support since ADIS documents and disseminates the data while respecting fair principles. And while well, universities that university data platforms inform users on the new regulations and principles of data production, which helps the latter create reusable data. So it just goes around. So in every stage of the process, university data platforms and IDs meet and communicate regularly, as we are all part of Progedo, which organizes uh, regular meetings with all the engineers of UDPs and IDs, and also with the producers. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you all for that time. And we're open for questions. Yes. Thank you, Ida and Elodie. And uh, let's dig into the questions. Uh, I think I see one raised hand and one question in the chat at the moment. Uh, I think uh, Matti was the first one to raise his hand. So let me ask him to unmute. Let's see if we. Uh... It's Mati who has to uh, unmute. Yes, I've, I've, also, yeah. I've asked him to unmute, but uh, well, we are. Uh, this is the exciting time because I, I'd say, like, uh, very often it's uh, there is no question, but now Mati has unmuted himself. So yeah. go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was offline for a moment. No problem, uh, but uh, you raised a hand, so you, you have a question. Probably. Oh, that that, that was that was a mistake. <laughs> well, that was the. Uh, I usually say this like one third there is no question, one third is a mistake, and then the uh, one third there isn't actually a question. Well, do you happen to have a question now when you are actually speaking? No, no, <laughs> okay. unfortunately not. I, I'm I'm saying a question. Yeah, I'll I'll, 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 right. I'll I'll mute Matti and we'll take. Uh, uh, the Q &A. Uh, the, the Q, let's take the Q&A first and then the chat question. Yeah, so are you planning to replace Nestor at some point? It's it's up to discussion currently. Um, we are looking for uh, something to replace Nestor at some point, yes. But it's not decided yet of uh, what we are going to use. But if you have some ideas, thank you. <laughs> I'd say there is an advantage to Nestor is that many uh, social science um, surveys actually use Nestor to disseminate the data uh, internationally. So it's quite useful for, uh, for end users of the data to be able to, uh, to work with Nestor. It is, yes. So that's why if we replace it, we want something that is um, very qualitative as Nestor. Okay, we have another question in the chat from Alena uh, for LOD, especially uh, where the data uh, is stored. Where the data is stored, we have um, a partnership with uh, another uh, large research infrastructure in France who is uh, Humanum and uh, it's uh, on their server, a very secure server. Okay, Q&A seems to be uh, popping. Um, so from Wolfgang, uh, do you enable users to access the DDA XML directly also, or do you plan for this? Uh, as my knowledge, I, we are not uh, letting uh, users uh, access the DDA XML directly. And uh, I, 
I, I, I don't know it's, if you're uh, planning to do this. If I may, uh, if it's the same as for CDSP, um, it's downloadable, downloadable on Nestar. Normally, Nestars or Nestar allows you to do it. Okay. But I'm not sure uh, if it's. I think it's the case for you to. Okay. I don't see any new questions at the moment, but I would like to uh, make one myself uh, regarding the university um, platform. Yeah level uh do you see that the sort of a uh, the knowledge base is there uh, assuming that there are a number of uh, data specialists in different universities do you need to uh, raise the awareness or provide uh, additional um, instruction uh, for them to be able to uh, sort of a, do their part in this infrastructure Uh, Ada, you are um, muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just need to take this habit. So this is a very good question. Thank you, Thomas, uh, because there are several levels to reply to it. Um, our main difficulty is that uh, France produces a lot of data uh, and quality data. And uh, people don't know it exists. They do not know about the surveys that are made or even about the administrative data. So our main job is to let people know that real and quality data is there and has to be reused because it costs to be produced. Okay, so that is one possible answer. Another possible answer is that um, there is a difference between being a data analysis specialist and knowing how to use a software and uh, knowing where to access data, uh, how, to, um, how to order it, how to receive it, you know, because with ADIS, for instance, you have to uh, pass through a, a process, which means you still, first you have to have an, um, an agreement from the, uh, Committee of Statistical Secret, as we call it, which we, where you say, uh, well, I promise uh, not to uh, do with the data something that I didn't claim I would do. So there is this whole process. It can take six weeks. And end users need to know that it takes time to obtain quality or confidential data, but that we are there to help them. And there are little engineers of the sort that can inform on this precise uh, process. Does that reply to your question? Yeah, yeah, I think that provided additional information, uh, at least from my, my point of view. Uh, and with that, uh, we are out of time regarding your presentation. And I think still on time uh, in the... Uh, more general level. Uh, and I believe everyone is able to see the Q&A because we have answers in writing there too, uh, regarding how to uh, download and, and where to download uh, these, uh, uh, these data sets in, in the, your infrastructure. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Ada and Elodie. And uh, Thank you we'll, Thank you, we'll move on. Okay. And let me get to my notes again. So next up, uh, we will take a DDI profile journey at SESDA. Uh, and our second presentation also has two speakers, uh, Darren Bell and, and Gerin Borshevsky. Uh, Darren joined us uh, from the UK Data Archive at the University of Essex where he currently oversees all technical activity and development uh, as the director of technical services. Uh, he has been at, uh, at the UK DA and working with the DDI since 2012. And over the years, Darren has worked in a variety of infrastructure and development roles in both uh, the public and commercial sectors. His particular technical interests are in data modeling and semantic web development. Uh, Karen 
uh, is a research associate at Gesis uh, in Germany. Uh, she has been working at Gesis for about five and a half years and is currently the project lead of the System Metadata Office Task 1. And her research interests are mainly in research methodology. So, Karen and Darren, you're up next. Perfect, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I believe we don't see you, but... Uh... Yeah, you can't see me, that's true. <laughs> um, but hopefully you can see my screen now. And that's correct. Okay, great, perfect. So um, hello again, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our presentation today. And in this presentation, we will introduce some of the most recent work of the SESA Metadata Office. Um, we will give very brief introductions to SESTA, the Metadata Office, and the SESA Metadata Model, the CMM, and some of the material based on the CMM. But the main focus of this presentation is, as Thomas mentioned, on the DDI profiles for SESTA um, Euro Question Bank and the SESTA Data Catalog. And those profiles were produced by my colleague, Darren Bell uh, from UKDS. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with SESTA, I will give a short introduction. SESTA is an alliance of social science data archives of currently 21 member countries and one observer. And SESTA creates and runs services for the social sciences. It brings together social science data archives across Europe. And SESTA aims to promote the results of social science research and to support national and international research and cooperation. Now, the Metadata Office project started in 2019. Metadata Office forms a conceptual and strategic group to maintain and manage SESTA's metadata related developments and materials. Both UKDS and GESIS have a shared lead for this project. The other project partners are FSD from Finland and NSD from Norway. The Metadata Office gives recommendations to SESTA service providers on metadata. We monitor metadata developments and other relevant consortia, institutions, initiatives, and projects. We define strategic metadata requirements to help plan and implement tools and services. The Metadata Office also manages the content of the European Language Social Science Thesaurus, ELST, and related multilingual vocabulary services. MDO updates the metadata materials we are responsible for, as for example, the SESTA metadata model. Those materials are all based on the Data Documentation Initiative Standard DDI. One of the main materials um, the Metadata Office is responsible for is the um, CMM. The CMM, the SESTA Metadata Model, is SESTA's official metadata schema. The first version of the CMM has been produced within the SESTA Metadata Management Project. The CMM is built from the viewpoint of quantitative social science data. It serves the purpose of helping SESTA service providers to make that data more discoverable and understandable to users. CMM is based on DDI 3.2. The latest version of CMM was published in November 2019, and both the CMM and the CMM user guide can be downloaded and cited using the DOIs displayed on this slide. One of the tasks of the metadata um, office is to further develop the CMM. And service providers who want to get the metadata into SESTA tools like the CDC or EQB need to ensure that their metadata is compatible with the metadata schemas of those tools. The tools metadata schemas are compatible with the CMM. However, the CMM contains more metadata elements than the metadata schemas of the tools. Therefore, the CMM can also be used if the metadata schemas of the tools shall be enriched in the future, or it can be used as a reference for rich metadata by all social science data archives who wish to extend their schemas. And now Darren has the floor. Okay, thanks, uh, Karen. 
Uh, okay, this presentation is mostly about DDI profiles, uh, but it's very useful to understand the context uh, and how we arrived uh, at the decision to start building DDI profiles. Uh, now, as Kerin has highlighted, the CESDA metadata model has been uh, in progress for quite a while now and uh, was originally done in Excel. Uh, but what I'll highlight in the next few slides is how we progressed on that journey from Excel through to XML schema, uh, more recently to UML, and obviously the, the main, uh, main focus of this presentation, which is DDI profiles. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, let's take a step back uh, because often with DDI, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the technical environment, uh, but sometimes it's useful to take a step back and say, why are we actually doing this? Uh, so in CESDA, our particular use case with the CESDA data catalog is that service providers produce DDI uh, in a variety of flavors, whether that's 2.5 or 3.2, uh, CESDA harvests that metadata from uh, OAA providers, service providers, takes that into the local CESDA databases and renders that on the uh, CESDA data catalog website. Now, essentially, what we want to do is improve metadata quality. That's our primary goal. The CESDA data catalog is only as good as the metadata that's in it. So we need tools and mechanisms and infrastructure to make sure that the metadata is as good as it can be. So the, uh, the, the XML schema for the CMM was that first attempt to try and improve it. So next slide, please. Okay, so Excel is brilliant uh, as uh, we all use Excel for information gathering and tabulating information. Uh, but the problem comes when you start to want a uh, program against Excel. Although it's technically possible to write C Sharp or Java code to manipulate spreadsheets, it's a very uncertain business and really it's not suitable for uh, machine actionable semantics or machine actionable structures so while excel is a great tool for information gathering uh, a year a little over a year ago we decided that we would take excel to a another level in terms of formally describing the metadata and formally describing how the different elements uh, and properties were, were stored and structured in order that we could build more robust tooling on top of it. So in 2019, we had a discussion internally at the metadata office, uh, and we decided that we would take what was in the Excel spreadsheet and effectively convert that into an XML schema, which would have all the elements captured so far. And within the CMM, there were approximately 500 or so elements uh, with various attributes. Okay, at, at that stage, we weren't quite clear what the tool chain would be once we'd uh, converted that into an XSD file. Uh, but essentially, we started transcribing uh, the contents of the Excel sheet into an XSD schema. So the CESDA metadata model effectively has different mappings to DDI codebook or DDI lifecycle uh, and contains information, uh, documentation information that we uh, mark up into the schema as excess app info annotations, which can then be transformed into human readable documentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of you will be familiar with XML schema, some of you won't, uh, but just to give you a visual fix on this, uh, this is analysis unit, which is a very common element in DDI. Uh, within the schema here, you'll see that there's an ID which tells you what the actual specific number in the CMM is. Uh, there's a little bit of documentation that goes eventually into the HTML web documentation. Uh, and we also say what the X path is in DDI 3.2, for instance. We also have an indication that this element is recommended, as you can see here. So the whole XSD uh, file is probably about six or 7,000 lines long, but this just gives you an idea of what it actually looks like in reality. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the CMM XSD, as I said, it's about six or 7,000 lines. Uh, essentially, what we do is take all the individual objects, if you like, whether that's a study or a person or a data set uh, or a publication. And then under the top level, there is, uh, a, you know, it's like a hierarchical structure. I mean, this will be familiar, obviously, to anyone who's done XML development. 
uh, but essentially it's if you think of it as a very large tree so we start with the 11 objects at the top and then you expand out study and then you would have bibli bibliographic information and citation for example so it, it's a very typical uh, kind of XML schema but again this uh, gives you some kind of visual fix on, on what it actually looks like uh, when it's actually edited in, in a tool like Oxygen XML Editor. Next slide. Okay, so XSD is a great way of taking Excel uh, and formalizing it uh, and making it much more structured with robust semantics. The problem with XML, uh, as, as we began to realize, is that no one is ever actually going to create an XML document that's based on the CESDA XSD schema. Now we had a number of discussions uh, with, with the DDI Alliance as well. And essentially what we're trying to do here is create a model rather than a schema that's gonna be used to create XML documents. Now it's very useful to have a CESDA metadata model because that can tell us uh, what elements within DDI across all dialects of DDI, whether that's life cycle or code books, it tells us what CESDA actually supports uh, I mean, DDI, as, as many of you will know, is a very, very large specification and can be a little bit intimidating uh, for end users due to its sheer size. So the CESDA metadata model is an attempt to say, here's a subset of DDI, you know, you just need to focus on these elements for day-to-day -day use with CESDA in terms of the CESDA data catalogue and the European Question Bank. Uh, and we will provide additional documentation on top of the DDI schema to help you use these elements. So XSD uh, does give us a really good head start. It formalizes the Excel spreadsheet into uh, a, a much more structured uh, and predictable uh, kind of schema, but essentially day-to-day -day use, it's a, a transition stage on, onto the next, uh, the, the next obvious manifestation of the CESDA data metal, metadata model, which is a UML model. The next slide. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with UML class diagrams, uh, essentially a UML model uh, is, if you think of it in its simplest terms as boxes and relationships. Okay, so a study would be a box or a class as it's, as it's officially called. A study is related to variables because a study contains many variables, for instance. So we have lots of classes which represent objects, uh, studies, questions, instruments, I mean, all the stuff that makes up our, our environment uh, that we want to manipulate. So, you know, if, if, you, if you haven't come across this before, if you think of modeling tables in a, in a SQL database, something like that, uh, it's not quite the same, but that at least gives you an idea of, of the kind of thing we're talking about. You have entities and relationships each class, like a study, can have attributes, uh, which might be a title, uh, and, and those have relationships uh, to other, other classes. Okay, the diagrams themselves are actually stored ultimately in XML, uh, sorry, in a, a XMI, which is a format which allows you to kind of trans, transport it between different editing tools. And the great thing about a UML model is that it's not specific to XML or it's not specific to uh, RDF or linked data. It's an abstraction which is very flexible uh, and, and very portable. Okay, also uh, anyone who's familiar with DDI4 or DDI CDI latterly will be well aware of the model based approach, uh, which means that rather than starting with an XML schema, you abstract all the stuff that you're trying to work with, and, and then that's very powerful in terms of being able to generate different types of, of schema in different languages. Uh, UML model, uh, UML class models also can pick and mix uh, things from other models as well. So within the CESDA metadata model, the, the UML class diagram, we can, we can basically pick in other things from the DDI uh, class models uh, if we need to as well. So it, it, if, you're not, if you haven't seen it before, it's not, a very easy thing to get your head around, but essentially uh, it's boxes and arrows and, and a way of abstracting how we model all of this stuff. The next slide. Okay, so the UML model at the moment uh, is, is being developed. We, we hope to have it ready by the end of January, uh, but to give you a visual fix again, uh, this is uh, DDI CDI. Don't worry about the detail in here, but this essentially describes the basic principle of a UML class diagram 
which is you have boxes uh, which have attributes. So it's stuff that's related to stuff and it gives you an overview how all the moving parts uh, fit together. Okay, next slide. Okay, so on to the main uh, focus of this presentation, which is DDI profiles. Uh, as I've explained, there are a couple of uh, roads we've taken. Uh, one is the development of an abstract model via an XSD file. So from the Excel sheets to the XML schema and then onto the UML model. That's all the modeling stuff and, that, and that's great. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, UML models are a, doc, a reference. Uh, they're, they're useful to uh, go back to and say, you know, this is the list of elements we support. Our fundamental operational problem is that we needed a mechanism to improve the metadata quality for the CESDA data catalogs, particularly, and also uh, longer term, the European Question Bank. Now, DDI profiles have been around for a long time. Uh, and are a well-established mechanism uh, to essentially say that out of 800 elements uh, in DDI3, we insist that you have these 15 elements. So you define a subset of DDI and say for this purpose, uh, i.e. the CESDA data catalog, we need you to have these particular elements. There might be another 10 elements that you want, which are recommended, but broadly speaking, uh, you know, the, the DDI schema itself won't tell you everything you need to know as to how to do DDI properly for this specific use case. So profiles have been around for a while. Uh, we can create as many profiles as we need. So we can create a CESDA data catalog profile for DDI 2.5. We can create one for 3.2. We can create another profile for the use in the European Question Bank. All of these things are specifically targeted at, at very uh, specific use cases. Now, the DDI profile mechanism has been round, uh, around for quite a while, but as is often the case with DDI, uh, there are great sophisticated models, but not enough tooling to make it happen. So we decided uh, towards the end of the last year that we would focus on building a tool uh, to help us actually use DDI profiles. It's one thing to write the profile, another thing entirely to have a tool that can use it to check metadata quality. Next slide. Okay, so just to recap, uh, an XSD schema uh, defines all permissible elements uh, in an XML document. So for codebook, there's a codebook schema which will tell you all the things you could use in DDI. A DDI profile will tell you all the things that you should or must use uh, for a particular use case. Uh, so that, again, that defines a subset of elements that you need. Okay, uh, as well as having uh, the basic profile, you, there are mechanisms within it where you can define your own semantics. Uh, so to give you a specific example, in a DDI profile that there's no obvious way to say that an element is recommended, which is a very common, common requirement. What you can do within DDI under something called an instruction element is provide some machine readable semantics that enable you to state and validate that a particular element is recommended, for instance. So any service provider who produces DDI to be harvested by CESDA the first thing they should do is to use the XML schema file to validate things like structure. Uh, that's what the codebook XSD schema file will do. And then we additionally provide a profile uh, to check that particular elements are there or that they're being used in the correct way or that they have uh, a particular controlled vocabulary associated with them, that kind of thing. So it is a two-step process. So the CESDA data catalog, I mean, XML Lang uh, is not mandatory in the schema, but for our purposes, for this specific use case with the CESDA data, CESDA data catalog, we would want to say it is mandatory and we can do that with a profile. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, to give you a visual fix, uh, I, mean, I am well aware that not all of you are, uh, are XML developers, uh, okay, but this is what a DDI profile looks like. It's basically uh, a, an XML document. Uh, the uh, the CESDA data catalog one is about a thousand lines long, but this is the top of the file. Uh, you can see uh, that 
there is a profile version. The current one is 1.02. Uh, we have a title for the profile uh, and there is some information there that says this profile is specifically for validation of DDI 2.5. Uh, a profile document itself has to be well structured and conformed to a DDI profile scheme uh, itself. So within a DDI profile document, you know, it is quite a long document, but it is very well structured. Uh, and, and there is a DDI profile schema, essentially a template, which tells you how to write these. Next slide, please. Okay, so looking at the DDI profile in a bit more detail, every element that we want to use uh, is it is, is marked up, uh, you know, whether it's mandatory or for user documentation, and we extend semantics, uh, you know, so here we might say this element is recommended. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so the tooling that we use to validate this is called the CESDA Metadata Validator, and that's been out for testing now for uh, a couple of months. So here you can see that we have a profile, we have a document that we want to validate the profile against, uh, and the bottom you can see the report that tells you what's wrong with your document. So as well as the profile, we do have some tooling now uh, to help us uh, use those profiles. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are currently published at the moment on Zenodo. Uh, the two at the top are the ones we've already published. We're working on the CDC 3.2 profile and early next year we'll be releasing the European Question Bank profiles. Next slide. And finally, some lessons learned. Uh, we will talk to the DDI Alliance uh, about improving some of the semantics that are available within the DDI profiles. Uh, the review process has been interesting with different audiences. We have Java developers, uh, myself, for example, as a data modeler, end users. So it's been a great collaborative effort. But in terms of the review process, we've learned to do these things on Bitbucket uh, and raising issues rather than trying to sort out complex issues on email or base camp, for example. Uh, for example. Uh, yes, and as I say, as a collaborative effort, different audiences have, have different understandings and perspectives of profiles. So it's been very interesting over the last year to see how people uh, approach those. And uh, the, the most important thing I would say is if you're going to do this kind of collaborative design and effort, do nominate a person who is responsible for the decision making. I think, uh, you know, while collaboration is great, sometimes you need someone to be in the middle of the room to say, everyone be quiet now, this is what we're going to do. Uh, otherwise, you can, you can, you can be debating for a very long time uh, about uh, specific small issues. So yeah, so that's hopefully a, a quick overview of where we are with DDI profiles. Uh, Karen, do you want to uh, just briefly say where what we're working on next? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. So um, for the CMM, the current most current version is currently under review, and um, it will be published sometime in 2021. And um, then the next CMM version will be worked on in 2022. And as um, Darren already mentioned, the UML model and the DDI profiles um, will be updated in 2022 um, based on the feedback we get in 2021 for the ones that will be um, published sometime in the beginning of 2021. Okay, so uh, basically that's it from us. If you have questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them if possible. All right, thank you for your presentation. We are basically out of time uh, so that we are getting to uh, hear other two presentations. There are two questions in the question uh, Q&A tool and one in the chat. Um, and I, I propose we take the one in the chat and if you could answer, I mean, type in your answer to the Q&A tool um, so everyone can see them there as well. Uh, but uh, in the chat, Laura asked, uh, will the UML model uh, allow to properly handle horizontal relation, for example, identify multiple language versions of the same questionnaire item or question? Uh, yes, I'm just looking at that now. Uh, when you, I'm not quite sure I understand the question about horizontal relation. I mean, Okay, uh, what we would probably not do is instantiate uh, 
different language versions uh, as different objects. Uh, th this issue has arisen uh, especially with uh, the CESDA metadata model and in, in the CV manager as well, whether we treat languages as individual objects or whether we treat them as additional properties of a single object. My own personal preference is to treat languages uh, as uh, properties of a single object. So I guess the answer to the question is, yes, we can handle those kind of relationships, but we wouldn't model them uh, as horizontal relations, as, as, if I understand you correctly, as, as we're doing them here. So very quickly, just to clarify um, the question, uh, I meant horizontal as opposed to vertical, for example, in the handling of concepts, uh, of mm -hmm. concept hierarchies that are yeah. uh, vertical, uh, because in, in this case, you would want to be able to see the connections um, of a single uh, question that has actually been asked uh, uh, in different languages, but you're not treating it as kind of different uh, uh, objects necessarily, uh, mm -hmm. but strictly yeah. versioning of uh, the same object where you can identify the language. Okay, I mean, in terms of a UML model, uh, we, we would have, I mean, the, the, the question class would, I, I, I'm not sure I quite understand about the versioning dimension on, on, on this. Uh, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Laura was able to use the Q&A tool, uh, but sort of to be mindful about the time for the others, I... Mm -hmm. I uh, must uh, ask you to sort of, uh, hopefully you're able to do that uh, in, in Q&A or, or in one of our virtual channels um, because we already have our next presentation presenter giving us yeah. a stern look uh, because people in, in Switzerland know about time. And uh, But thank you, Karin and Darren. And we will move on and hopefully uh, the uh, uh, those questions will be answered uh, in the in the Q and A tool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next up is a joint presentation on on Paradata. Uh, that's by David Schiller, Ingo Barkov, uh, Anja Perry, and Wendy Thomas, and Genevieve Michaud. Uh, and Ingo uh, is presenting in behalf of David Schiller. Mm. Ingo uh, has been working at the University of Applied Sciences at the Crisson since 2015, first as a lecturer of data management, then as a professor, and now as the head of the Swiss Institute for Information Science. And prior to that, he was a data management at the German Institute for International Educational Research in Frankfurt, where he held technical management positions. And Ingo currently serves as a vice chair of the scientific board uh, in the DDI Alliance. So Ingo, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. So I hope you can see my presentation and it also flips. Does it work? Yep, it does. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, uh, yeah, more or less from, from the topic side now for something completely different. Um, so we are moving away from, from DDI profiles to Paradata, and Paradata is somehow a little bit an, an, an overlooked product. And uh, David, actually, who was supposed to, to do the presentation today, but he could not do it because of teaching obligations. That's the problem if he's uh, a lecturer somewhere. So he asked me to uh, jump in and uh, present this presentation, which was thankfully done by Dinef Yet, based on a paper that we wrote. So David actually, two years ago in 2018, when there was the Eddy conference in, in Berlin, he suggested uh, having a, a DDI group on, on Paradata because uh, he simply felt the need uh, that also this is kind of, of, uh, of what is, how should we call it, metadata, there was also discussion with metadata, what is it actually, should also become in, in, in the focus. And we followed his, uh, his, his call and I have to point out, we are currently not an official DDI Alliance working group, but I think I will come later to that. So we are now showing what is the deal about data, Paradata, what are we planning with that? You can receive from the title in which direction it is heading, but maybe here in the agenda, 
some more hints on this. So we are first going to define what Paradata is and what it is not, then give some use cases, uh, how Paradata is used. And in the end, also what could, could this mean for DBI and what could also this mean for the group as well. So um, the first problem that we have is if you look at the, uh, basically this whole presentation is by the way, based on the paper that will be re uh, released soon. And uh, uh, I will also hint a little bit more on that on the end of the presentation. So there is now at the moment, what from what we did for this paper, no clear definition of paradata. So the, the problem is, is the multitude of, of different uh, data that is derived from the survey process. So, and most of the people really only consider that as some kind of auxiliary data. So it's basically describing how the data collection process want this, uh, it's linked to survey research, but the problem is it very often gets lost on, on the way. So most of the time, if you have something like a process, you specify, for example, in social science, the questionnaire, you give it to a data collection agency. They are basically processing the data collection. They're generating the paradata while doing that. And at the very end, <clears throat> there's only the result file that comes out of that. If you look at some presentations that I also saw yesterday, paradata often goes into this big box, which is labeled raw data. So it's basically something that happens during the survey process. Uh, some of it is reported back uh, when uh, in, in the end result files or the, 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 the data files are constructed but some of it simply does not make it in. And we had in several studies the problem that simply uh, going ahead with this process somehow loses also to, to some data loss. So paradata, when it's handled by data collection agency, it depends really on the main mode of data collection, what is happening. So for example, it can be uh, constructed automatically. For example, you have some tools and these tools generate log files. For example, they, uh, record every keystroke that is done during a survey. Or, uh, it's, it's basically, if you have a questionnaire with multiple branches, it records in which branches are you going to and writes all of this, these well, values into log files. And at the end, this log file is passed and the result file is constructed by the last value. You see, I'm a computer scientist. The, uh, 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 from the last input that was handled in this log file, this is what goes then into the data file. But part, what happens in the meantime, might be recorded in a log file, but might, uh, will not be transported into any other file at the end. Or it can also be done manually. For example, I had surveys where you had observations. We then simply gave, gave people a paper questionnaire. So when we did data collection and we did addi additional um, surveys like, uh, before you enter the house, how does the house look like? Is, do you think, this was a question to the interviewer, do you think, uh, in which, which social category does the person look, uh, living in this house fall into? So simply they had an additional paper questionnaire where they also had to give answers. And this was also something that belonged to uh, the world of paradise. Or, or the question of um, disposition codes, for example, I could not enter the house because there was a dog. I could not finish the interview because the person has died. These are typical disposition codes that lead to response rate at the end and also, uh, but maybe they don't make it from the data collection to the final um, to the final result file. So you have the response rates, but you might not know completely how it was constructed. So this is also different levels. So it can be at, at interview or survey agency level, it can be at response, uh, response level, it can be at item level, so something happened with the item while it was just answered. So there's a multitude of paradata that is actually happening. And it's therefore very hard to define what it is at, at, at the end. And uh, therefore maybe the, the point how to answer what it is and what it is not is for example, also by looking what it is not. So as I just pointed out, paradata is not really auxiliary data. So it can be from different sources. It can be from stratums. It can be from commercial sources. It can be from a multitude of sources that are factored in. And also the distinguish between paradata and metadata is also always not that clear. As I get, just gave the example of the response rate. So some of the metadata is in fact paradata that is, has been passed through or was calculated on based on paradata. So to give some further examples, uh, 
Parent data can be call records, it can be contact histories, can be disposition codes, it can be audio recordings which are done during the survey, where you can look at pauses, voice pitch. For example, it's, it's, it's interesting thing for research. If somebody answers a question and you have an audio recording and there is a pause, the, the, the analysis question can be, why is there a pause? Why does the person not really answer immediately? Or also what we are always very interested in, in keystrokes or navigation within the survey or if answers are corrected. We do a, little, a lot of educational surveys. And for us, the end result a student writes into is not as interesting as the way how the student came to this answer, how much time the student took. Or was the answer in the meantime corrected? For example, did the student first have the correct answer and then show and change to the incorrect one or the other way around? So there is a lot of analytical potential that we don't simply tap if we just look at the end result because there is something, it's, there is a zero, one, correct, incorrect, and that's it. But if you look at the way and at, at the time that has been taken, it's, it's quite a different picture. Also sensor data, when we, for example, look at uh, was the interview really con conducted at the place that we, it was supposed to happen? For example, we have very often the example that eight interviews uh, took place at the same cafe in the same town. So we simply know that the interviewer faked the interview. And these are happening so that you can see from the paradata. You might not see it from metadata or the resulting data file. So what paradata is currently used for is, for example, for improving survey quality for field monitoring and also cost control. For example, in the example of GPS, we would simply not pay that interviewer. It's, uh, we have the survey error message that's all, uh, measures that's also included. Uh, also correction of error or post-survey assessment. We can see if there is a mistake in the result file by looking at the parent data. And also it generally uh, improves survey quality, quality, especially in longitudinal uh, studies. So, but there is a problem that we also face here in this in this session, actually, uh, especially in, in, in Europe, of course, um, paradata, because it's simply raw recording into log files in multiple instances, where you see, really see everything. If somebody types the name in, it's separate letters or separate positions in the log file, then um, you have a much higher re-identification risk than in, in, in metadata or in, in, in results files or data files. The other thing is also no standard format and also post-processing. If you have megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, long log files or audio recordings and everything, the post-processing is very consuming, especially if you think of anonymization. You have an audio recording and you have to basically remove the names or blanken the names out in, in the audio file. It was quite, quite, quite tricky and quite time consuming. Um, what we also talk about in the paper is about everything that I just explained. We have multiple studies where we show how uh, examples from, from this is used. I just take the first example, PIAC, that's the study that I worked on. There we have exactly these, these things. We have disposition codes. We have um, a recording of mouse movements and, 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 and uh, keystrokes. We have uh, uh, basically observations. We did, did, did things like we recorded people why they were filling in the study to see if they were motivated. So there was a motivational additional study that uh, in, in some of the countries that, that basically did uh, audio and video recording. So there's a lot of additional data that is happening. And, and, and actually this is the sad case because in, in, in Germany, uh, while I did the study, I was still working in Germany, in Germany, there was a lot of things done with the study additionally. And uh, we did log file analytics and showed this to other countries. We showed this also at the conference of the PIAC Nordic countries. And then the Nordic countries came to us and said, oh, this is sensational, this log file analytics. Um, can, 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 we, can you also do that with our files? And we said, of course, can, we can do that. And then they went back to the data collection agencies and said, can we have the log file so that the Germans can do this additional analytics? And then the data collection ag agency said, oh, uh, no, so, no, we are sorry. We already uh, erased all of that because nobody normally needs this. So this is actually an attitude that you have very often towards this, this, this uh, towards paradata. Paradata is good enough to the point 
that you have a, a data file creation, but afterwards is very, very often discarded and it's not kept, though there is a, a huge analytical um, uh, potential. And you have this everywhere. You have it on clinical trials, you have capture protocols, and also to give it from another perspective, we are not talk, 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 talking about the data collection. Parrot data can also happen after data files have been provided, because actually uh, parrot data can also happen if you post-process files. So for example, if you construct new variables, if you harmonize, if you do data linkage, linkage then there should also be the possibility to describe what happened in the certain stages, because very often it's very unclear what happened from in the certain stages until a new variable was provided. So we have a multitude of uh, non-structures or non-standardized uh, additional data that has a high value, but there is not too many effort put into uh, the long-term preservation of it. So it supports currently the evaluation of the primary data collection. It is used for verification, quality control, everything else, but we see a really high potential also in the reuse of the parent data. As I just pointed out, um, you can get additional data analytics on a parent data. Actually, there is, if you have the path of the parent data, you have a much clearer picture how the variable was con constructed at the end. But the problem is that we need a basic framework. We need basic requirements for this parent data because otherwise it's simply Everybody has a propriety locked format, which at, you end up in something like a stream of consciousness that a secondary person could not analyze. And if we, for example, move towards a model, then um, also this can also be embedded into the first steps of study design to, to get to a result where analytics later might be much more possible. And this is actually the purpose of the group. We would like to have a model for paradata so that really it can be a, a full research object, it can be published, it can be reused. And this would also elevate Paradata from being a byproduct to, to really standard documentation because it's really highly useful. And the question, of course, for the DDI Alliance is, would there be the possibility to have the DDI expression of a Paradata model? Because at the moment, um, DDI as a DDI life cycle, um, I, I think DDI three ISS have more possibilities with that. But currently, for example, DDI life cycle can some, describe something like, yes, there is a file. Yes, there is paradata, but cannot describe what is in it, really. Uh, to give a comparison, it's more or less the same um, connection like a higher level uh, metadata standard like Dublin Core or Mark XML as towards DDI. You can, for example, in Dublin Core say something like, well, this is a DDI file, it was created this and that. It has, if you want to know something on the, about the format, look there, but it cannot describe the question items and elements which are in, within a DDI format because it's much more high level. And we have the same connection more or less between DDI and, 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 and paradata if, if, if somebody wants that. So, what does this mean in, 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 in this context? So we are kind of, so what, what does this mean also for this group? So we really want to start a discussion here that David already started two years ago, but we want to follow up on that. So therefore we have um, three papers in preparation. One is almost finished. It's the first one. This is actually the one that the presentation is based on, leveraging paradata from capture to analysis. This is graphs of paper, paradata. Then a second paper, we have only the title, we have not written it yet, it is formalizing paradata as a standard. So basically thinking about a model that paradata could have. And the last paper would be, what does this mean for DDI? Can what we, the thoughts that we have in the second paper put into practice for DDI, that this connection between metadata and paradata could happen? And this means, of course, the following thing, Currently, we are not an official group, but we would like to be. So as you might have heard, the scientific board is in currently restructuring. We will have from 1st of January a new scientific board. And uh, the first order of business that we as an informal group would like to, uh, one of the first tasks would, uh, as, as an informal group would be that we apply to become a proper uh, DDI working group working on paradata and also 
we would like to, to uh, invite you all, if you are also interested in this topic, uh, to participate in this group. And of course, you can already now co uh, uh, contact David for this, but the formal call would most likely come in the moment that we have been accepted as a proper working group. And I hope I'm still halfway in time. So that's, that's it for me. Thanks for hearing. And please consider joining the group. Thank you, Ingo. And uh, well done regarding time. Uh, I mean, generally, we're running a few minutes uh, behind. But I believe uh, we should have a chance to take one question if there is such a thing. And I don't see anything in the Q&A or chat uh, at the moment. But I have a one sort of a follow-up question uh, that mm -hmm. I started thinking during your presentation is uh, thinking uh, what kind of things go into uh, Paradata. Would that be something that you would use artificial intelligence to analyze? Absolutely. Thinking about, so does that, produce something uh, when you think about the uh, the DDI and uh, the XML to support it, how you are able to integrate this bit? Maybe, maybe I know it, maybe we did not get question because it's really an exotic topic and it shows again. Um, I give you an example from, from a study, what you can do with Paradata, what you cannot do with metadata and result files. Um, we did a study where we can predict, so we do data analytics, we do machine learning, and we did do prediction on the log file. We can, from the first two seconds of the mouse movement, how a student um, navigates in an item, we can uh, predict with a certainty of almost 80% if the student will answer the question correctly or incorrectly. And that is exactly the analytical power because the the solution, the way of the solution can already be, or if the student has understood from, from in the first moment how to progress in this exercise, uh, it's already shown very early and therefore we, are, we have already a predictor that can uh, basically, that you can learn and that can be found out by data analysis. And that's exactly the predictive, predictive power of, of Paradata that you don't have in any other data type. Thank you. Uh, always happy to ask a question when it shows that I was on topic. <laughs> right. Uh, no other questions. Uh, thank you, Ingo. We move ahead with to our final presentation uh, of this session. Uh, let me introduce um, uh, the speakers. So last but hardly the least presentations uh, introduce, introduces us the ethnic minorities across the Europe project and uh, speakers and uh, Ami Saji and Laura Morales. Ami, uh, who will be presenting, is a junior research uh, researcher based in Sciences Po in, in, in Paris. Um, she supports the SS, uh, HOC project in making quantitative data on ethnic and migrant minorities fair. Prior to this, she served as a network coordinator in ethnic survey data and project working in the NGO sector, specializing in refugee settlement, migrant integration, and workforce development. She holds a Master of Public Administration in Social Impact from the London School of Economics and Political Science and a BA International Studies and French from the Ohio State University in the US. Uh, and Laura Morales is a professor in political science and comparative politics at Science Po. She specializes in the political dynamics and consequences of immigration in the civic and political inclusion of migrant origin minorities in survey research on migrant origin populations. And she currently serves as an action chair for the International Ethic and Migrant Immigrant Minorities Survey Data Network at COST the European Cooperation in Science and Technology. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for the warm introduction. Um, before I get started, I have just two apologies to make. Um, I am recovering from a cold, so it's very possible that while I'm presenting, I may start coughing. So I'll try to capture myself, mute myself, so you're not all listening to me uh, hacking away. And then the second thing is I'm having some connectivity issues. So I'm actually going to switch off my camera once I start sharing my screen, uh, just as a precautionary measure. So 
Let me go ahead and do all of that now. Alrighty, so hopefully you see my screen here. And let me go into the presenter view. All right, so as uh, Thomas mentioned, I am a junior researcher uh, based at Sianspo, and I'm here today on behalf of a data community that's dedicated to the ethnic and migration studies field, um, as we've been working uh, together to untap the unused potential of quantitative surveys undertaken with ethnic and migrant minority populations, and we call them, uh, this group uh, EMM for short. I'm also joined here today by Laura Morales. Um, she won't be presenting, but she'll be available to participate in the Q&A Q at the end of this presentation. Uh, to structure today's discussion, I'll begin just with a brief overview about our data community, just so you understand who we are and where we're coming from, and then transition to describing how exactly we as a data community are facilitating the reuse and sharing of EMM surveys through metadata. So as I mentioned, our data community is dedicated to the ethnic and migration studies field. More precisely, we bring together producers, users, managers, and curators of EMM uh, surveys and collectively, what we're trying to do is create tools for and resources about these EMM surveys so that we can facilitate access to and quality of knowledge on the inclusion and integration situation of EMM in the various economic, social, and political domains of public life, not only within Europe, but in neighboring countries. And the actual tools and resources that we're creating are designed to appeal to different end users and they're also intended to promote the FAIR principles. And just in case there are some of you who are not familiar with FAIR, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so our most noteworthy example of a tool or resource is our EMM survey registry, which in a nutshell is a free online tool that acts both like a census of existing EMM surveys and is a single access point to information, in our case, metadata, about these existing EMM surveys. And this registry that we have is currently available live in beta version, meaning it's fully functional, just not displaying all of the metadata that we have. And I'll explain a little bit more later on what I mean by that exactly. So as you probably have already guessed, it is in fact our EMM survey registry tool that is allowing us as a data community to promote the reuse and sharing of EMM survey through metadata. So let's take a closer look at what this tool actually entails. So as I mentioned, the first characteristic of our EMM survey registry is that it is like a census of existing EMM surveys. And what we mean by this exactly is that our registry is aiming to capture any EMM survey that meets the following conditions. First, it's quantitative and sample based, which means that we're actually not capturing things like administrative data or qualitative surveys. The survey also has to have been conducted since at least January 2000. Um, I will just kind of put a little asterisk here that this cutoff date has a little bit of flexibility depending on the country and the, the survey kind of landscape in that country. Um, another condition that it had to meet is that the survey had to have been undertaken in one of 35 countries. These 35 countries are primarily located in Europe, and they're not random selections. They actually correspond to the 35 countries that are officially participating in ethnic survey data, which is a research network funded by the Cost Association and is a formal kind of participant in our data community. Um, we also determined that the uh, surveys would need to uh, examine at least one dimension of EMM integration. And then finally, um, we needed to ensure that the survey included a sizable number of EMM respondents. And we define sizable uh, based on the achieved sample size for the EMM respondents. And we have different sample size thresholds in place depending on which country the survey actually took place, the actual territorial coverage of the survey. So we're talking here about whether it was conducted nationally or at a subnational level. And then finally, whether the survey uh, was conducted with the general population or if it was in fact just with EMM respondents. And before applying this inclusion criteria that we've developed, we as a data community use a rigorous search protocol to see what kind of surveys actually exist in each of these 35 countries. And once what I guess we could call almost like a master list of EMM surveys was produced for a given country, we then screened out surveys not meeting the inclusion criteria. And then for those that did, we could then proceed to collecting and compiling the metadata so that these surveys could be displayed on our EMM survey registry. So now this leads us to the next important point, which is about the actual metadata that we're offering via the EMM survey registry. So as I also kind of mentioned previously, the EMM survey registry's second kind of key characteristic is that it's intended to serve as a single access point to metadata about the existing EMM surveys. And what this means is that the metadata that we're offering needs to be detailed, 
organize and structured so that whenever anyone looks at the metadata for a given survey, they get more or less a good picture of what the survey is really about. And we decided that the best way to go about all of this was by setting up a metadata schema for our registry, which we developed kind of very crudely through a five step process. So as a first step, we identified the different types of information uh, that we wanted to include and we called them variables. Um, and this resulted in us selecting over 200 different variables to be a part of our schema. So as you can tell, it's a very rich schema that we have. Then our second step then was actually organizing these 200 plus variables so that they would appear in a logical order and format and would allow people to easily kind of understand all the information that we're providing. And so what we ended up creating was 11 different sections, each covering a specific type of information. Um, so for example, we have a section that covers the general characteristics of a survey. So that would be things like the name, the, the start and end dates of a survey. We also have sections about the sampling method used or the sample sizes. Um, and we even have a section dedicated um, uh, to how easily the data sets, uh, the technical documentation, and the questionnaires are available for reuse for future uh, research purposes. Now, the third and fourth step, which I want to place a special kind of emphasis on, um, are related to how our metadata schema is linked to an existing data documentation standard. I also want to acknowledge that these steps required the involvement of the CDSP of Sciences Po. So I also want to thank them very much for all their contributions uh, to help us to help us do these two steps because without them, um, it would have been nearly impossible for us to to realize them. So the third step uh, actually involved uh, determining the specific documentation standard we wanted to use for the surveys that we're working in so that we could foster reuse and interoperability. Um, and per the recommendation of our CDSP colleagues, as well as our SESTA partners, uh, we settled on DDI Codebook for two reasons. First, DDI is the documentation standard that's used uh, widely within social sciences survey research. And then two, given the type of information that our metadata schema is capturing, we felt that codebook as opposed to lifecycle would be a more appropriate uh, of a choice because our schema doesn't include some of the unique features uh, that are special to lifecycle, like the relational uh, uh, components. And also we understand that lifecycle is more complex relative to codebook and requires uh, the use of an adapted or a specialized documentation tool like Collectica. So we decided that for us that the step wasn't necessarily uh, needed. So then after selecting DDI Codebook as our documentation standard, uh, the next and fourth step we, we did was to actually map variables from our schema onto specific DDI Codebook elements. And this mapping exercise was actually executed by Alexandre Marot, who uh, previously worked for the CDSC, but has still uh, part of our community because I saw that he was uh, participating in a session uh, earlier on this week. And then also by Elena Dansu, who is also uh, here with us today um, for this session. And um, we worked with them uh, just to provide input and intervention as needed, but uh, really it was them that, that executed uh, the whole kind of mapping uh, exercise. And through the mapping exercise that they did, uh, they produced two different outputs. The first being an Excel-based correspondence uh, map, just to show how each of our variables maps onto specific DDI codebook elements. And then an XML file prototype, so we actually could see how our metadata could be displayed uh, that conforms with DDI codebook. Uh, I'll also mention here that because of how rich our metadata schema is, we don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between our variables to the DDI codebook elements. Uh, so to give you a concrete example, uh, the element for data collection uh, or data collection situation, sorry, uh, is linked to seven of our variables. So these seven variables include things like who the interviewer was, what languages the interviewer spoke, and the number of questions the questionnaire had. Now, the final and fifth step then was actually translating this uh, finalized metadata schema we have into a user friendly template so that we can ensure that we're applying the schema whenever we're collecting and compiling metadata for a survey. So what we ended up doing is creating two different types of templates, the first being uh, one uh, available through Excel. Um, and how it's structured is we display all of the metadata variables in a single column, it's the left hand list column. And that way, um, we're able to capture the metadata for a single survey within a single column. And this uh, Excel based template is what our data community has been using to code metadata for the surveys that they've uh, identified as meeting our inclusion criteria. 
We have also, since launching our EMM survey registry, have transformed this Excel-based template into an online form that's available directly on the registry. Um, and the idea here is that we eventually want to move away from the Excel-based version so that uh, we have a more direct way of contributing metadata to the registry itself. Now, having completed this process of setting up a metadata schema, this means that we're actually applying it and then are able to create metadata that can then be shared and reused on our registry. Um, so as I alluded to in the previous slide, our data community right now is contributing metadata to the registry. Uh, specifically, we're using the Excel-based template to co-metadata for EMM surveys, meeting the aforementioned uh, inclusion criteria. Um, and then once they've compiled metadata, uh, the metadata itself undergoes a multi-stage and rigor rigorous quality check process to ensure that what's been coded makes sense collectively. And it's only after the metadata has passed this quality check process that we're able to upload and subsequently display the metadata on the registry. Now, as I also as alluded to in the previous slide, we have an online form as part of the registry, and it's an adaptation of the Excel-based template. Uh, this online form isn't quite available yet uh, because it's undergoing the final stages of testing and trialing. Uh, but when it's ready for release, we will be reaching out to data producers of EMM surveys so that they can they themselves can contribute their own metadata for their surveys um, because we know that our data community may not have been able to capture all of the EMM surveys uh, EMM surveys that are out there for example um, surveys that have been conducted outside of the 35 countries that we're targeting or even surveys that maybe have a very limited or hidden online footprint so it's really difficult to find despite uh, the rigorous kind of search process that we've adopted. Um, and similarly with the Excel-based uh, template, any metadata that's inputted onto the online form will be going under the same rigorous multi-stage quality check process so that all the metadata that's displayed on the registry has been vetted by us. Um, so given where we are in terms of collecting and compiling the metadata, our live version, so again, it's in beta version right now, has actual metadata displayed. And again, this metadata is uh, what's been contributed by our data community. And as you can see from this map, we have 40, uh, 14 countries already uh, included uh, in this latest version. They're the ones uh, marked in green here. And for the 20 or so remaining countries, uh, we have metadata kind of already being compiled and it's just undergoing different stages of the quality check process. Uh, so I would say in the next few months or so, we expect to add in metadata for an additional five to six countries, assuming that we're continuing on with the same uh, workplace that we've been uh, kind of experiencing over the past few months. Now, in addition to finalizing the metadata that we're producing via our data community, we've also been thinking about ways uh, as to how we can further enhance how the registry's metadata can be shared and reused. And one way we can actually do this is setting up an API that allows machines like other SESTA um, or like SESTA archives to harvest our metadata. And as you may recall, as part of our metadata schema, we ensured that our variables were matched to DDI codebook elements. And so using the Excel-based uh, correspondence ramp and the Excel file prototype that we uh, received from Alina and Alexandre, we were able to set up um, as part of our registry a way to offer for each survey an XML file that displays the corresponding metadata in DDI codebook. Concretely, what this looks like um, is that we have a link next to each survey that's been documented or captured on our registry. Um, and then by clicking on that link, it allows you to generate uh, an XML file with the metadata that's actually there for the survey in, D in a DDI codebook compliant manner. Um, so what we want to do is now build on this mechanism that allows DDI codebook compliant XML files to be produced on a per survey uh, basis so that we can actually have an API that allows you to call or retrieve all of the metadata on the registry at once instead of going one by one. Uh, we are still exploring how we are actually going to be able to set up such an API. Um, but at this point, we do understand that the API will need to conform to a harvesting protocol called OAI PMH. Um, a final point I want to make about how we're further enhancing uh, the reuse and sharing of metadata through our registry is about facilitating buy-in from actual users of the registry, which we understand to be data users and data producers of EMM surveys. Uh, because while our data community has done a significant amount of work to set up the registry so it can provide 
useful and meaningful metadata about existing EMM surveys, its sustainability rests heavily on how much data users and data producers actually engage with the tool itself and its metadata. So starting with the data users, we need them because they're the ones who can actually validate the value add and utility of the registry in developing and informing their respective research or even policy related work. So what we're doing is we're rolling out targeted presentations to data users from all different sectors, different countries, so that they can see what the registry could do for them. As for the data producers, they are needed because they're able to contribute new metadata. As with the data users, we're also rolling out targeted presentations to this group, uh, but this time focusing more on how the registry can help them showcase their survey to an international audience and in turn help them uh, improve their chances of their surveys being reused by other researchers or policy oriented professionals. And the beauty of all of this is that once we have buy in from both data users and data producers, they work essentially together to keep the registry going. Because as data users use the registry, the more incentive there is for data producers to contribute their own metadata. And assuming the data producers contribute new metadata and, and in turn expand the overall metadata offering of the registry, the more likely it is that the registry can attract even more data users. So as you can see, this is how the cycle continues. So uh, hopefully this presentation has provided you with some new insight about how an actual data community dedicated for the ethnic and migration studies field has been promoting um, how metadata about EMM surveys can be shared and reused. And I look forward to hearing any comments or questions you might have or even feedback you have about how we're approaching um, or uh, interacting with metadata. And then I also mentioned here that uh, we do have a project email address here that you're welcome to reach out to and it's checked regularly. Um, we do have a website for our data community so you can learn a little bit more about us. And then this is the direct link uh, to the registry tool itself. So I'll go ahead and stop my screen. Thank you, Amy. And no worries, we are a couple of minutes uh, uh, past the end of the session already, but since this is the last one and uh, there isn't an immediate session beginning, there's no problem. We can take a few questions or so we'll have some discussion here. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Are there any in the Q&A? No at the moment. So this is your chance to uh, come up with one or two. Uh, personally, I would sort of I was thinking about the sustainability um, where you finished and the and the work you do on enriching and um, enriching the metadata. Um, how much work is that? Uh, I mean, the enrichment part basically. And uh, do you think that is something that you're able to sort of continue as a as a shock service in the future, or how that goes? That's a really good question. Um, so we're not yet at a point where we started to engage um, external kind of individuals to start contributing to the registry, but that's something that we want to do soon um, because uh, the metadata that our data community has collected is almost all done. We're just kind of going through the final rounds of checks. Um, our hope is that we have captured a good amount of the EMM surveys um, that are out there. So we wouldn't be looking at too many um, having or needing to be added to our registry. But that's something that we'll definitely need to think more critically about once we open up the registry to external users because there is an end date to the Shack project. Um, and right now our team is quite small. It's myself, it's Laura, and then we just have some handful of uh, research assistants who are able to provide some um, on the spot help uh, as needed. If I may jump in very quickly, um, uh, the issue is not so much necessarily enriching the, the metadata that already exists, but actually uh, ensuring that uh, data producers actually add their future surveys, uh, because surveys are being produced as we speak. Uh, uh, we think that that's the main issue at stake, uh, ensuring that the, the data producer community buys in as uh, Ami uh, said, and they will introduce themselves directly the metadata from their surveys. Um, and that's the part where we don't know yet how well this will work. Um, if the model uh, uh, is based on the premise that it would be the central team at Sianspo updating the metadata for 35 countries um, every year, I don't think that that's uh, uh, sustainable as such. 
uh, unless we get more funding in the future beyond the duration of, of the shock project and we're included uh, uh, in a structural manner in the infrastructure calls uh, because we wouldn't have the capacity. But if we do uh, uh, persuade data producers to add their own survey metadata, then that the tool can become self-sustainable uh, in, in the medium uh, term. Uh, and that's why this buy-in is essential. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, let me check uh, for any additional questions around from the audience. I don't see any, which probably means that uh, everyone is happy with the answers so far. Uh, and that in general would mean that we are at the end of uh, our Eddy session on reuse and quality. So thank you, uh, Ami and Lara, for your presentation. And uh, at this stage, I would usually ask everyone in the audience to join me in thanking our presenters with a round of applause. Uh, in this case, uh, that might not be the perfect way to do it. Uh, what I propose is that we uh, give them a, uh, a standing ovation instead uh, and uh, uh, sort of a rise from our chairs or couches or wherever you have been listening um, today and do our daily exercise because, uh, before whatever the meeting is uh, waiting for you next. So thanks again, everyone, and I hope to see you in the afternoon session.